Hey folks, hope you're doing well. It's Michael with the CCERP Podcast. Hope you're enjoying getting outside the local area, getting some sunshine, get your vitamin D. We need fresh air and sunshine and forest air, um, some good clean nature with all this stuff going on. I mean, in our lives in general, but especially with all this COVID stuff, all that stuff, make sure we stay healthy. Um, but Today, we're going to talk more about flooding in Houston and flood management, how we can manage human-built places and what we do, um, and to the extent we can manage some of the flooding. Um, Of course, we cannot make flooding go away. Not going to happen. Um, All we can do is manage the situation. Flooding is a fact of Houston, um, where we live. And so um, today we're going to talk with Marianne Piacentini of Carrie, Katie Prairie Conservancy. Um, can you say hi, Marianne? Hi, I'm Marianne. How are you? Nice to meet you, Michael. Yeah, likewise. nice to talk to you, Michael. All right, a little technical difficulties. We had to take care of those folks. Sorry. Okay, so again, Marianne, can you introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, I'm Marianne Piacentini. I'm the president and CEO of the Katie Prairie Conservancy. Katy Prairie Conservancy is a nonprofit land trust that's been around since 1992, and we're working to protect and restore coastal prairie in southeast Texas. Cool. I have a background, which you asked about earlier. I have a master's in city planning from Harvard University, and I have an undergraduate degree in political science from the University of New Hampshire. So clearly, I don't sound like a Texan. I am from <laughs> New England. Uh, but I've been here long enough to really care about the city and the county and I'm working trying to make it better, not just because of what we do with the Katy Prairie Conservancy, but also what we do um, w- within the city and county. Our, our program. Yeah, some people say really quickly, yeah, it's like, I might not have been born in Texas, but I got here as fast as I could. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, that's true. And given that two of my three children were born here and they live here, I think we're going to stay here. My husband is a native cool. Houstonian, so we're here for good and, and we love it. I mean, it's a it's a wonderful place to live. It has a lot of things going well for it, but there are certain challenges that we face, not the least of which is clearly uh, we have alternate periods of flood and drought. Um, right now, we've been very lucky not to be to experience uh, the uh, disastrous hurricanes that have come through to Louisiana, but we know all too well what can happen. And I think that we're working as a community to try to solve some of those issues. Mm -hmm. Um, When was KPC founded? We were founded in 1992. We got our first director in 1997 and he happened to be Carter Smith, who is the director of Texas Parks and Wildlife, is a fabulous person. I succeeded him in 1999. So I have actually been with the Conservancy as obviously its longest employee. Second longest came Hmm. eight months afterwards and I hired him. But I've also um, was before that had run a number of other nonprofits, including what's now you start. Wait, you're breaking up again. You okay, Let, let's use the phone. I, I okay. think we better use the phone. I'm going to go get my phone. I'll be right back. Okay. Hey, Michael. Sorry. Katy Perry Conservancy, I told you, is a land trust. And one of the things that we do is protect land. We've protected over 24,000 acres of land in southeast Texas, the majority of which is in Harris, Waller, and Fort Bend County. About 18,000 acres there. And then there's another 6,000 acres that we've protected in Matagorda and Jackson County. But we also restore land. The original Katy Prairie had beautiful wetlands and tall grass prairie. A lot of it has been converted to agriculture. And so we are bringing back some of the native grasses. We have restored about 5,000 acres of the wetlands, which are great depressional wetlands because they hold water. In addition to restoration and land protection, we also provide access to the public. We have a Matt Cook wildlife viewing platform, which is at Warren Lake at 15,000 Warren Ranch Road, and it's open every day 
seven days a week, 365 days a year from about eight in the morning till about six in the evening. It's ADA accessible and it offers people an opportunity to bird watch off the road. They can park in our parking lot and walk down to the platform. We then also have the Ann Hamilton Trail at our Indian Grass Preserve, which is 31975 Abair Road. And people can go there. Tuesdays through Fridays from 9 to 1, and the first and third Saturdays of every month. In addition, we because we are about an hour away from downtown Houston, we have the option to do some projects in town. So we have our Prairie Builders Parks and Schools, which is an opportunity for us to work with schools and parks and universities to create small pocket prairies to show people what the value of the prairie ecosystem is. It not only provides pollinator habitat, but it actually helps hold more water on your lawn or your area. We, in addition, did our nine natives for sun and nine natives for grasses. Not everybody wants to have a wild prairie in their yard or even can because they might live in a area that has a homeowners association, but they want some beautiful native plants. And so we have developed some programs that and guides and booklets to show you how to do that. We also have a virtual wild, virtually wild program that is we do with Fish and Wildlife Service and the Nature Conservancy to bring the outdoors to people. I know that you talk a lot when you open up your podcast about getting out and making sure that you have a chance to get some sun and some vitamin D. Well, there are people who can't get out, especially children who are undergoing medical treatment, Mm -hmm. but we want them to know about nature. So we do this program with Fish and Wildlife and the Nature Conservancy, and we show them what it's like. We also were able to expand that to get it into Houston Independent School District. So thousands of children who might not be able to go ahead and have a field trip are able to see what is a black neck stilt. Why, why are snakes venomous? Which snakes are venomous? How do you care for and look at, you know, fireflies? What are the kinds of things that you can do? So we do all those things. We also do research with a lot of universities where, and with the state of Texas and Texas Parks and Wildlife, we're doing something on the Western chicken turtle as to see where its range is. And we're finding that we have a lot of Western chicken turtles, which they had not anticipated was going to be the case. And yes, and we're looking at uh, a bunch of other, you know, vegetative and um, wildlife species. So, that's that's kind of what we do but the thing i should tell you that is is that there's there are there are values that we provide to the community in addition to just providing wildlife habitat we provide as i you heard those recreational opportunities but we're also an area that provides local foodstuffs we actually have a 6000 acre ranch oh, cool. that does what's called regenerative ranching grazing cool. and Awesome. It helps bring back, yeah, exactly. It helps bring back, you know, native grasses. Um, and, you know, we, we still have rice farming on the Katy Prairie, which unfortunately there's not much left, but we at least have it. And then we have improvements in air and water quality. We sequester carbon through our soils and we improve water quality through our wetlands. So I think we're, it's, it's you know, I told you a little bit about my background before. The thing that's so wonderful about this job is that I am able to do so many different things because we do so many different things. Mm-hmm. Cool. Can you hear the blower outside? Or is it? I can. Okay, I I'll can. turn off my microphone when you're talking then. But, okay. Um, awesomeness, yeah. Putting a lot of <laughs> dust in the air, blowing stuff around, helping people get not get exercise. That's Blowers are awesome. <laughs> Love the noise. I wish you could play 24 seven. Yeah, just so awesome. <laughs> Great. It could uh, be could be white noise, right? Yeah. But <laughs> um, so that's interesting. Yeah. So um, the Katy Prairie stuff, conserving land. It's not just something. Some people might say, "Oh, that's just some hippie thing." Using keeping people from using land. Nothing's done with it. It's undeveloped. But 
that's not correct. There's actually a lot of value there. And there's, with more education about ecology and biology and what's going on, we see that there is a lot of development there that Mother Nature has done that benefits us. It doesn't have to be a human built thing to be developed and profitable in a general term, not just profit in terms of money, but profit in terms of value in general, you know, your soul, socially, everything, but there's a lot of profit to it. Um, and you mentioned a lot of good things, education, um, the, the ranch, um, water conservation, water cleaning. Is there anything else you want to add to that or elaborate on? Yes. It, the most, probably the most important thing is that we do pro su provide flood risk reduction. Um, our lands, I told you before that we sequester carbon. Well, native grasses and tall grass prairies are actually really wonderful for absorbing water. They're way better than other kinds of vegetation like your Bermuda grass or your um, just pasture. So we do that, but they also slow down water because, you know, the absorbing the water, it's because they have such great roots underneath. And they actually, even because of um, the, you know, what when the water clings to the sort of stems themselves, but in addition to that, because they, there's a roughness to the vegetation, they slow down water. So when water starts to flow over them, it's not just a whoosh the way it goes off your driveway. It actually slows down. And then I told you before about we store water because of our depressional wetlands. So now, are we going to eliminate water flooding just with, with what we do? No. But we are a part of the picture. And I liked what you were talking about, that it's not just the profit modem, mod, motive. It's, it's also, you know, natural infrastructure. If it's there, it's already there, we should use it. So are there wetlands? Are there forests? Are there, um, you know, uh, like sand dunes that are natural, oyster reefs, things that you want to use that are natural infrastructure. And then there's also, of course, the nature-based solutions, which means that you're mimicking nature. So it might mm -hmm. be an engineered oyster reef or an engineered levee. And those are things that can add to the value, often are more cost-effective. I, I told you earlier that I'm from New England, and I always have this illustration that I use, and it's just great. I'm sure people get tired of it because I talk about Massachusetts all the time, but it was in the 60s, the Army Corps of Engineers decided that they wanted to build a dam to protect the cities of Boston and Cambridge from flooding by the Charles River. And they had the project at the time, now remember it's the 60s, so it sounds cheap now, but it was about $100 million. It was going to cost a million dollars to maintain and operate, and it was likely that within 20 years, it was going to require significant restoration or re, you know, renovation for it. And so everybody was looking like, okay, that's going to do it. That's what we have to do. And a group of community people, a group of even engineers, uh, some of the people at the Corps decided, is there another way? And they looked upstream and they found that there was about 8,500 acres of wetlands naturally occurring that were holding water, that was slowing down water, that could actually perhaps be a better solution to protecting Cambridge and Boston. And they bought them for $10 million, one-tenth wow. of what they were going to cost. But the good news is, is that over time, not only have those wetlands stopped Boston and Cambridge from flooding, with the exception of the Superstorm Sandy, which you know was a massive storm. And the only thing that Boston and Cambridge had was part of it was because of the surge. It, it was acted like it was a two-year storm. It was nothing. Huh. But wow. the other cool thing about it is, is that the community has, has risen up around those wetlands, and they have created recreational trails. They've created all kinds of amenities, and those those wetlands have pretty much cared for themselves. Hmm. Obviously, sometimes the vegetation gets overrun or inundated, but they're they're they they work. And 
I know that the National Wildlife Federation, which is a great group, has done a lot of work on looking at what can you do before storms? What can you do to prevent things? And they show that one every dollar spent on trying to prevent flooding and doing things right um, saves about six or seven dollars in disaster recovery costs. So isn't that a great financial incentive to do that? And also, even beyond the cost, think of people's lives. Their homes aren't flooded if we can help it, if we can work together. Their their lives aren't put in risk. They don't have to evacuate. Now, we know Houston's flat. We know that we get a lot of water. And we know that Sometimes the water doesn't go exactly where we thought it was going to go. <laughs> and it goes, it goes. Yeah. Exactly. It goes someplace else where maybe we haven't armored up. We haven't done the kind of, of flood risk reduction yet that we need to. And so we probably are going to continue flood. But if we can do everything by using nature, by mimicking nature, and using creative engineering solutions too. Together, I think we can come up with cost-effective solutions, solutions that work better, solutions that are make us more resilient, and that clearly are going to ensure that people are kept from harm's way. And I, I have a wonderful quote I use all the time that is done by a satirist in AD4, uh, 4 AD, uh, named Juvenal, and it says, never does nature say one thing and wisdom another. We need to we need to listen to that, and we need to use nature as much as we can. And if we need it in addition to what some of the more hard structure opportunities are or projects, that's okay, too. But at least we will have recognized that there's this benefit. I know that George Mitchell, if we want a... Um, uh, uh, an illustration or an example closer to home hired Ian McCarg to develop the woodlands. And one of the things that they did is they realized that they could use the forested wetlands that they had and the whole system there to make a natural drainage system. Mm-hmm. And they saved millions of dollars from doing that. And cool. with the exception, I think of hurricane Harvey, the woodlands did not flood. And, and that's and an they exception. Were Harvey, able... it's like what? You know, yeah. I teach homes like some people who are homeschooled in Minnesota. I teach them doing some science. Um, and uh-huh. um, I was doing some ecology with one of them and uh, privately, private tutoring. And I was looking up um, the yearly, average yearly rainfall for them. And it's like, and Harvey, <laughs> we had as much rain in like, what, three days is the r- record for them has been in any entire year. Wow. You know, 50 That's inches amazing. or so. Yeah. Yep, exactly, <laughs> like, exactly. So, could, they, could, your, could your student even fathom it? Could they even, you know, sense what that would have done to their community? Probably not, because how often do really people talk about biology or ecology enough nowadays? There's too much. Physics is great. Sure. It's important. But too much focus on that or in biology, a waste of time dealing with like DNA stuff, which is important for some people. But most people should focus on things where they can really learn to think and see how I, physics and biology work in the world. The pressures and pulls with like floods or something like that. Um, yeah. Or yeah. how much rain is there? And if they got outdoors more, they could get used to what it actually is. Like I, I mm-hmm. take some people out near Cypress Creek sometimes. and. I'm out and I know what the flooding's like. And I say, yeah, sometimes, um, see at the top of that roof, um, deer and Harvey water was over that. And they're just like, wow. <laughs> you know, they, they can't even like, like make sense of it because they, like, they probably don't think that, look, it's like dry water's way down there in the Creek. Like how could it ever be this high? It's like not possible. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but well, anyway, you'll, you'll anyway. laugh. When I first started at the, um, at the conservancy, I thought, wow, wouldn't it be great to have canoe or kayak trips down Cypress Creek? And people laughed at me, <laughs> and I didn't realize it because there are so many parts that are dry, but when it rains and we have storms, it's raging. You couldn't do it. You'd kill yourself. Yeah. And so they said, it's, it's just, it's, it's, you know, it's too, it's either, it, it, there's no in-between. 
It's not mm-hmm. like, you know, Buffalo Bayou where you can go down and it take a, a leisurely kind of kayak trip or canoe trip. Instead, it's, you know, like you're, you've got the sort of rushing waters. It looks like you're in the rapids kind of thing. Yeah. But anyway. And then some places where it's not, it's like sometimes the something underwater, like, and the water on the surface doesn't show what it's going like, what's going on underneath. And um, people can misjudge. Um, yeah. Get in yeah, big trouble definitely. that way. But, yep, exactly. Yeah, so I wanted to talk about the rain thing there with the inches, but we were talking about the woodlands and developing that and how they really helped, except for a little bit during Harvey. You want to continue on that? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah, I think, you know, we, we all recognize that there's going to be a lot of rain. And like during the tax pay flood, the Conservancy's land held water for four to five days, in some cases a week. Some of our properties were under five feet of water. The good news is that for the most part, other than some trash and debris and maybe losing a few fences, our lands were able to come back. You know, obviously, you couldn't have inundation of water long term because you disrupt the life cycles, both of our vegetation and of the, you know, terrestrial wildlife. But but for that period of time, that four or five days, we held that water back and it didn't go downstream. It didn't put pressure on attics and uh, mostly attics. We, we feed mostly into attics. A little bit of our property feeds into um, uh, Barker. Of course, obviously the two reservoirs are independent. They, are, um, they, they, they work together, but we felt very happy and very fortunate that we were able to absorb that water to hold that water, to slow down that water for that period of time so that it wasn't going into people's houses. Now, goodness knows enough people still got flooded, but at least we weren't adding to that um, that impact. Um, but, you know, the other thing is, it's very interesting. Um, I told you before that I'd, I'd been with the Conservancy since 1999, and our conservation director has been with us at the same amount of time. And we've gone through cycles. I mean, clearly, like in the 1998 and then like 2002 and 2009, immense storms. It was just a lot of water. Mm -hmm. But then in, you know, 2000, late 2009, 2011, I mean, 2010, 2011, 2012, that's when we had horrific drought. I mean, drought that they say was as bad as the 1950s drought that Texas experienced. So, I, I often am sub- interested that one of the directors of the Texas Water Development Board says that Texas is in a perpetual state of drought with periods of intense rainfall. We kind of feel that Southeast Texas is in a perpetual state of flooding with intense periods uh, intermittent of drought. Just the opposite, and it's true. I mean, we've been very lucky this hurricane season, as we we noted mm-hmm. earlier, that we haven't really gotten hit very badly. I mean, I know East Texas got it, and and Louisiana got it, and I feel very sorry for those people. Yeah. But we they got the Cajun Navy. Much more Thanks, hit. Cajun Navy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was it was bad, but but we have to be prepared, and I think we've learned a lot since you know Tropical Storm Allison and Hurricane Rita and. Uh, Ike and those things and, and the tax they fled. But, but even with Imelda, it was just such a surprise that we didn't expect that kind of intensity of rainfall. And I think that a lot of us are, who are in this field are recognizing that we need to, and I am, I am no expert on this, so I'm not going to pretend to be, but, but we are looking at elements of climate change and how can we adapt how do we have to, in some cases, you know, animals are going to migrate. People are going to migrate. Sea level rise. Where are people going to go? I, I just read an article about Florida, and it was very interesting that some of the people in Florida, the mayors, are saying, oh, it's not a problem. we got it handled. And others are saying, no, we're going to have to mitigate for this. We're doing this, this, and this. And then others that feel like, my gosh, they may just have to abandon their whole area. I know that there's mm-hmm. a, when, when we were dealing with subsidence in the city of Houston, I know there's a neighborhood that literally had to be bought out because 
and it sunk so low because of us pulling out all the groundwater that people couldn't live there. There was nothing to do. Well, now with the, the deal in, you know, more hot, hotter days, more of them, um, longer, longer hot days that you, you know, you start instead of, you know, they used to say that you started like May 1 and you went to September. Now it's, I am see May 15th and go to September. Now it's, you know, May 1 and you go into October and we've got to find ways to as do that. I know that. Like it was like a long time ago where, um, used in Houston one summer, remember how we had 100 the temperature is 100 oh my degrees gosh, plus. I remember. <laughs> was it yes, like two I months remember. or 40 days? Or Yeah, it was awful. It was yeah. awful. And I remember wow. that Houston was really good about providing bases for people. They bust people in to rec centers and things. But I remember that there were a number of deaths in Dallas, which hmm. wow. had so. even higher counts than we did. Hmm. So you're right. But, but we have to look at that. And how do we adapt? What do we do? And I, I'm really proud to be a Houstonian because the city of Houston did a great climate action plan and they are looking at what can they do as a city, what can we do as citizens to try to reduce carbon emissions, to try to sequester carbon, to try to get to the point where we actually um, are in accord with the Paris Agreement objectives. And it's exciting to see that mayors all over the country are taking that action on themselves once the United States pulled out of the Paris Agreement. But, you know, a lot of people, I, I was at a Land Trust Alliance rally, not in person, it was all virtual, of course, um, recently, and a lot of people were talking about, you know, where are our most resilient places? Where are there elements that we should be prioritizing as the next areas to save and what areas might we have to give up and not actually spend money on saving if it's going to be underwater or it's going to be, you know, barren. And that's very sobering. I, I don't know about you, but I have children and a couple of them have children and I want to leave something that's better for them, not worse. Mm -hmm. And so I think a lot of people are now recognizing that we need to look at everything the, the way that you talked about before, making sure that young people understand about ecology and biology and, you know, zoology and botany and all the, you know, knees kind of thing to, to be able to realize that, that what is around them is actually shaping them and their lives. I know that, <coughs> I'm so sorry, during, during COVID, People have really recognized how important it is to get outside. Good. <coughs> so sorry. Hope they Let keep me get it a up. glass of water. Sorry. I hope it's not a temporary thing. <laughs> well, I hope I hope you're right too. It's um, it's clear that people are recognizing that you know they can't stay in their house all the time, and that it's important to get outside. But it's also the case that <coughs> I think it's making them realize that hey, if we don't save some of those places and we don't have them available for people, <coughs> we're going to be in trouble. And because not everybody has a huge yard. I mean, my, my son, for example, one of them lives in New York. He has no yard. Mm -hmm. It's a teeny tiny 600 square foot apartment. And, and, and if he didn't have Prospect I, he wouldn't have access to the outdoors. I mean, yes, he can walk the streets and things, you know, the sidewalks and things, but not the same. people like to go to parks. Yeah. And like there's that. a lot of scientific research more and more being done on the importance of that. It's not an option. It's important for our well being. It's kind of wired into us by nature. Right. It's a necessity. Yeah. We, we do need it. And, you know, it's in, and, and I think that, you know, there've been studies for a lot of people about how it, it makes you feel better, how it, keeps you healthier, how there's some psychic value to it that you can decompress when you get outside and maybe not even think about anything, but you don't realize that inside you're probably, you know, while you're calming down, you're probably thinking great thoughts. I know that sometimes when I take a walk, I used to listen to the news. I was such a news junkie. And then all of a sudden I realized it wasn't calming me down. It was I wasn't not that feeling important. better. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Okay, keep up with so, some. Yes, it's essential to know what society is, what's going on in society. But 
unfortunately, people overdo it, way stress themselves out, spend time on things they shouldn't. You need to, like, do more self-care and care about your soul and just make yourself to be the best you can. But. I agree. And I think that all of us, you know, realize that staying inside next to the refrigerator isn't probably a good idea. It's probably better to get outdoors. And, and you know, even outdoors, even during COVID, if you have your mask on, you see people, people are friendly, they wave, they stay socially distanced is great, but it's it's wonderful to not Usually feel wave, like, but oh. I'm outside barefoot and shirtless a lot, so sometimes people leave me <laughs> I like pick up trash, I have a trash bag over my shoulder. Sometimes people don't say hi to me. It's so funny. They go by with this, like, they look down the other way and they look like they're half scared. And sometimes I just, like, look at it in amusement, but... So well, you know. I, I used to walk the Rice University Trail. We, we live very close to Rice University. And one of the guys that I always used to see, he and his wife always picked up trash along the trail. And nice. I always thought it was so wonderful of them yeah. to do that. I didn't want to touch anybody else's <laughs> trash. But, yeah. you know, they came with, they had gloves on. And one of them even had, you know, one of those little pick things that, yeah. that sometimes maintenance people have. And it was very cute. But I, I thought, wow. They are really wonderful people to do that. Yeah, so I, get I would outside. applaud you. If I see you, you out on Cypress Creek, I'm going to say hi and thank you. I get that sometimes, too. You know, not everyone is like the people I just described. Like on July 4th, I was out. It's like everybody said hi. Every single person I passed, a gleam in their eye. They felt good. They were benevolent. They said hi. Some of them had conversations. It was awesome. And then sometimes I'm out. And people go, thank you for what you're doing. You're such a good person. I'm like, okay, that's too much. Stop. <laughs> but thank you. I think that's great. I think that's really wonderful. But, yeah, it's so awesome. Keep it up. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So I know we wanted to talk a little bit about the um, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers interim report, yeah. which has come out in an effort to try to come up with some solutions to reduce flooding upstream and downstream of Attucks and Barker Reservoir. And as you know, the report came out on October 2nd. The comments are due on November 2nd for an interim report, not a plan. It doesn't have a tentatively selected option. It has a number of alternatives that are to be moved forward for further study. Mm -hmm. A lot of people in the community have felt that 30 days is too short. They've asked for extensions. Cool. They would mm -hmm. hope that the Corps would grant that at least uh, for 60 days, if not 60 days, 30 days. A number of groups and organizations have requested more information on how the Corps made their decisions. All of the, the report, much of it is conclusionary. This is, this is right. This is the way to go. This is this. But it doesn't have what the modeling is behind it. It doesn't mm -hmm. have the, the data. And so in order to really evaluate what they're proposing, we've asked, would they submit that? And then last but not least, they had originally um, invited stakeholders, people who have a, a very special interest in this, to um, meetings before they did it during their scoping. And they found out things like people care about the Katy Prairie. People care about nature-based solutions. People don't want to see Buffalo Bayou channelized or or deepened and widened if it is if Fair if enough. it's going to impact you know the the nature of it and and yes they want to see you know flooding reduced they want mm -hmm. to see solutions but but we asked them would they come with the stakeholders and so far we have not gotten a response um you well, know they're they're receiving this from a lot of people and you know they have a process i, I understand it it's a, it's a they don't big, live here we're the ones that live here they're not well, going to have to put up with the results. At least not all of them. Some oh, live here, of course. No, not all of them. Some of them do yeah. live here. I mean, yeah. obviously the colonels keep going in and out because they're transferred about every three to five years. Hmm. But I think they care about it. This this particular colonel mm -hmm. actually is from Cyprus. He knows oh, wow. the area very oh. well. And he is, considers himself very involved and very knowledgeable. And, and I think he is. Hmm. I cool. still think that one of the things that they've done with this plan is that they're going forward with things that are essentially um, eight alternatives. And I'm not going to hit on all of them, but a couple mm -hmm. of them. One is no action. 
And they have to do that. Every kind of environmental review process that you have has to say what would happen. What is the future without a project? What would it look like? How bad would it be? And it offers you kind of a baseline of where we are today and where we would be 50 years from now, which is the, uh, the duration of the study period that they have to look at in terms mm-hmm. of making these extraordinary recommendations. They then looked at the Cypress Creek Reservoir, which is a reservoir that would be um, about 18,000 acres. It would be placed on top of about 75% of KPC's protected lands. It would have a 30, 25 to 30 foot embankment that is 100 feet wide and would have excavated uh, wetlands to create the berm, but otherwise would be natural, but it could hold up to 190,000 acre feet of water. And I wanna come back to that, but before I do, there's also um, a third alternative that is to I think the third one is the excavation of Attucks and Barker Reservoirs, which they showed that about 5 to 15 percent storage capacity could be increased if they did selective excavation. Um, they also had um, some buyouts along Buffalo Bayou. They had some, um, the, obviously, the channel, the widening and the, the deepening of the channel. They then had a, a look at what would it take to... Um, do a tunnel, and they decided to screen that out, even though Harris County Flood Control District believes that a tunnel might be a good idea. And the tunnel essentially could take the place of something like the deepening and widening of Buffalo Bayou. It's just to allow more uh, cubic feet per second to be conveyed from the reservoirs down to a terminus point, and that terminus point could be Galveston Bay, it could be the ship channel, it could be the um, East Water Purification Plant, and that instead of just doing flood reduction, you're actually reusing the water, whether it's for industrial purposes or treated so that it can be drinking water. I mean, really, some clever ideas, but the Corps didn't think of those. The community thought of those. The Corps said, no, 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 the tunnel is too expensive. We don't want to do it. Uh, we think that it would provide some localized benefit, but not system-wide benefit. So ultimately, what they chose to do is they chose to recommend that we have a Cypress Creek Reservoir, we have the widening and deepening of uh, Buffalo Bayou, or we have a combination of the Cypress Creek Reservoir war and um, Buffalo Bayou widening and deepening. Well, two things about that. One, the Buffalo Bayou project, there have been people recommending that we do things, and I'm sure Susan Chadwick told you this when she was talking, since 1950. And the community doesn't support it. They don't want that kind of alteration of it. Now, the core will say that it's going to be very natural and it's going to be really (laughs) wonderful. But then, then they talk about articulated concrete rollers that are going to you know, support the, the, you know, lap, so that you don't have erosion. And, and one of the gentlemen I've been working with said that those things are horrible. They have they're to ugly. maintain them all the time. Yeah. Uh, yes. They're ugly too. Yes. I mean, ugly, good ugly, question. Ugly. Aesthetic. if stuff like that I, were done I, to I, Cypress Creek, I would move. I would not oh, pick exactly. up any more trash because I would not be here. I would be out of here. Exactly. I mean, you know, I live by Braze Bayou and trust me, I don't really want to go to Brace Bayou because it's all concrete lined yeah, it's and sad. it's yeah. not fun. Although, you know, there are lots of people who love walking around it. I mean, that's why I like my neighborhood better because it has Rice University. It has all this green space. Mm-hmm. But anyway, so that, 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 was, that was one project. And screening out the tunnel seemed to us to be not a really great idea. And then, of course, the reservoir is, you know, our, our thought is, okay, we understand that Saving the Katy Prairie, expanding it, restoring it, isn't going to eliminate flooding. But it can be one part of a kind of four-pronged plan. And the first part is to save more land, to retain and detain more land in the upper Cypress Creek. And that would help with just keeping the water away from the reservoirs. And would it be a gazillion acre feet? No. It would be, and for, for your readers, like one acre foot is is one foot of water deep over an acre. That's an acre foot. Mm 
Mm-hmm. And um, and so it's the case. I mean, I know you know that, Michael, but but maybe some <laughs> of your readers don't. And it's yeah. kind of it's kind of good to visualize things True. like that. Very. But but we we would have the Upper Cypress Creek watershed uh, retention detention, and that's again expanding and protecting and restoring the Katy Prairie. It's having these shallow storage areas that hold water that would work with private landowners. They would maybe get some money from the Harris County Flood Control District to actually keep water on their land. They could still do other things. They could farm, they could ranch, they had the quiet enjoyment. But that easement over those those runoff rights would go with the land. So if someone ever sold it, the next person would have to detain that same amount of water and reduce runoff, which is great. And then some work along Cypress Creek all of which could do all the things I told you before, recreation, agriculture, wildlife habitat. And then in addition, because water does flow over Cypress Creek when it reaches a certain amount of water going through the creek and bleeds over into Attic's Reservoir, we want to contain the Cypress Creek overflow. Well, we think a better way of containing that is to have some retention areas in the upper Attic's watershed. So, Cypress Creek is pretty much pretty close to the, uh, the the watershed divide between Cypress Creek watershed and Cy- Upper Attics watershed where the overflow occurs. So what if you have much smaller reservoirs with land that isn't already protected? It's vacant. It's available. And yes, it's probably there are probably people who are already eyeing it for development. But so what? Let's save more land. Let's have it as a recreational opportunity. And we can capture that water that comes from the overflow on a one-to-one basis. Mm-hmm. For every, every acre foot we capture and store in the upper, acres, upper attics watershed, that stops an acre of water from going into the attics reservoir. And in the same case, we could also do some of that work on a long South Mady Creek and Bear Creek, and again, make wonderful trails, have a great, great park system. But but when it rains, especially when it floods, that water stays there. Nobody is living there. Nobody is going to get hurt, but the water is captured. And then when it's not there, again, it is a useful amenity, a wonderful yeah. amenity. Multitasking. So, so Whereas if exactly. a business is there, there's just one thing. Um, there's like many things that... You know, it's either a business or it's a destroyed business. But with the land, exactly. it's nature study, um, exercise, outdoor time. Um, people could have pecan groves, all kinds of things there. Um, water absorption. There's many, mm-hmm. many benefits and not just one. Or what about, exactly. look at all the businesses that, look at all the places where there was something built and there's nothing there anymore. How many if you get a lot of this, these millions and billions, why not tear some of that down, make some of that nature, make a bunch of little ponds so it's a distributed system, and mm-hmm. there could be a lot exactly. of water retention in these like abandoned businesses that no one cares about using anymore. You know, I, I agree wholeheartedly. In fact, what we say about our system is it is distributed. It mm-hmm. is distributive, distributive. It is. Um, it is decentralized. It can be replicated. It works with nature and it provides redundancy. So if one of those ponds fail or one of those depression wetlands fail or, you know, the, the land can't take it, there's something right behind it that works. And so we also recommended to the, um, and we're working with a whole group of people, not just us. So, so our plan was initially very much this same plan but now it's got a broader community. So instead of saying it's the KPC plan, it's kind of the, excuse me, the four pillars plan. And the four pillars are the first one is to reduce the flow into the reservoirs from upstream, which is mm-hmm. what I talked about with upper Cypress Creek watershed and the upper Attics watershed. The other is to go ahead and um, increase the storage capacity in Attics and Barker reservoirs. We know that the, the Corps looked at that But they decided, oh, well, we really can't do that. There's a problem with uh, you lose the clay soil that, that, you know, holds the water. You'll you'll damage the ecological value. Well, we think that there may be opportunities or it's too expensive. 
you know, to, to move the dirt. We think that there are opportunities to perhaps do selective excavation. We, we know that the water table is at different levels because the ground rises from the east part of the uh, reservoir to the western part because, you know, it's just normal slope. Uh, it, mm -hmm. It's the elevation is, is growing as you move farther north and west. So what could the Corps do? Don't we think we could do more? If we could expand the capacity of Attics and Barker Reservoirs, what that would do is mean that the vast majority of people who live in the pool would not be underwater during the next Harvey-type storm, especially if we're also doing the, you know, the, um, the reducing the flow into the reservoirs from upstream. So you don't have that extra body of water, which during Harvey was about 50, maybe 60,000 acre feet. It was no more. And you know, the, the, the dams normally I think hold 127 and they hold held 250,000 acre feet during Harvey. And that's the other reason they had to release them. So the other thing is strengthen the dam. Right now there's um, there are spillways and the water goes around the spillway before it goes over the top. Well, is that a design flaw? Should it be fixed? How can it be fixed? Is it just that that's the case that um, the uh, uh, land is so flat we can't do anything? I know that the dams have been um, uh, in the what's called the, the flood risk one, uh, which is a catastrophic risk of failure. It doesn't mean they're going to fail. It means that if they did fail, it would be disastrous and catastrophic for the community it would you know flood downtown it would flood um uh all of the medical center all those places and so obviously we need them to continue the work they've started to strengthen the dam and last um but and i'm, I'm going to get back to your point about buyouts later but the other you know the last kind of pillar is how do we convey the water out of addicts and barker um, so that it's ready for the next storm. So, you know, you, you fill up and then if another storm comes, which is what they were worried about with Harvey, because they were, they were cresting it, they were reaching the top of their capacity and they couldn't let enough water out at the normal two to 4,000 cubic feet per second release rate. They had to go to the 16, 15 or 16,000, which meant that it flooded uh, the downstream homes. Well, what if you had a system that was underground? and you were able to handle all the environmental issues. I mean, obviously the great news is that you're not buying a lot of right away above ground. It's underground and they, it, it works with our soils. Harris County flood control is already involved in a bunch of studies to show that it works. What might the roots be routes, excuse me, not roots routes <laughs> be. And then um, also, uh, you know, how fast, could you get it out? Is it 10,000 cubic feet per second? Is it 16? But so you have, you'd have storage, you'd have conveyance, you'd have armoring or strengthening the dam, and you would probably be able to resolve a lot of the issues without destroying one of our, you know, last sort of, you know, tall grass prairies or Katy Prairie that we have in this region. And instead, Instead of being subtractive, let's be additive. Mm -hmm. um, and so that that's kind of where we are. And our hope is, is that people, it's beginning to get traction. We're working with the business community, with um, the flood groups, flood prevention groups. We're working with a lot of other people that are beginning to say, hey, maybe this is a better plan. And our hope is is that not that we won't work with the core. We want to work with the core because they bring money, they bring expertise, they can help us. But we want them to go ahead and recognize that they need to work with community values. And if our community values are better served by the four pillars of flood reduction than their approach, why not work with us? Why not, why not, why not re reconvene sort of themselves and say, oh, our goal is still the same, but maybe the solutions are different. So that's kind of where we are. And I don't know if we'll, we'll succeed, but the hope is, is that we're certainly going to keep trying to work with anybody we can who might be interested in trying to find a solution that adopts the, that, 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 um, you know, that, that provides 
that no, that it includes the community values and the importance of what we're trying to do and incorporates them into these plans. And one thing, it's interesting how the way the culture is and education and influence of philosophy. Um, I have a degree in philosophy. I'm into education. That's my thing of necessity mm -hmm. plus by love. And it's interesting how this happens in other areas too, other, other things, but in there's a saying, don't put all your eggs in one basket in finance economics. It's known that you should not put all your money in one stock unless it's maybe Apple, you know, but, um, right. but even then they had the, <laughs> they could have had that tragic, like sudden loss of value, if not for Steve Jobs coming back. But right. they say, right. um, put your, you know, invest your money in different stocks across um, different companies and things. So you get the more the average value of the stock market and you're more secure in the long run. Um, if we should, you know, people would get some of that same thinking and apply it to the same, I, some, some concepts, some principles, and apply that to flood control and thinking more ecologically, we'd be better mm -hmm. off with this mm -hmm. distributed thing. Instead of having some major failure that wipes us out, depending on that one thing, as you're saying, there should be these distributed systems, backup systems. So just like if one stock, one company goes out of business, you don't lose yep. your retirement. Um, exactly. You know. I, I, no, no question about it. And I do think, you know, it's interesting. I have been dealing with what I thought were a lot of traditional engineers. And I'm beginning to realize that a lot of them aren't so traditional after all, cool. that they are beginning to look at things differently. They've Next also time. been hiring some younger people who really want to um, make a difference and want to see things that are differently. Um, and I think it's, it's important for us to nurture those people, to listen yeah, to their yeah. ideas Support and the to good. be open. I mean, you know, it, exactly. You and it, it, exactly. And it's just, it, it would be great to be able to let them shine in their own more corporate structure where maybe they haven't been listened to. And it would be great to, um, well, there was a new one. There was an old one already. Sorry. Um, so anyway, um, the, the, um, the, what was I saying? Anyway, but yes. Yeah, so, so that was the thing when you were talking about education that I think was so important is that, you know, we need to give young people an opportunity to get out in nature, to see why it's important to, to kind of feel it, touch it and love it. Because, you know, if they don't know it, they're not going to learn to love it. If they don't love it, they're not going to try to save it. And so I think that working with, with groups that, you know, whether it's, and not just a field trip, but it's groups like Texas Conservation Corps, or the Student Conservation Association, where they're actually getting people to come out and they learn about how to build a trail. They learn why removing invasive species are important. Mm -hmm. They learn all those things, but they also they're also getting paid for it as well. And they begin to say, hey, maybe I could have a career in a green job. And yeah, what good. would I need to do? How would I where would I go to school? To get this. I mean, I love people who actually have liberal arts degrees. So I love the fact that you have a philosophy degree. <laughs> Thanks. Because, yeah. and, and, well, it's because Me too. most of the people who have liberal arts degrees can think. They have critical thinking yeah. skills. They mm -hmm. usually write pretty well. And they also know how to read well. They, they, yeah. they can gather information. Whereas I, I remember once that I headed up the in the mayor's office, I headed up the planning division for community development. And one of the people that I was hiring, and it happened to be community development, was the Office of Community Development for the mayor's office. And one of these people came in, and her degree was actually in, in community development. And I went, really? Seriously? She ended up being a great staff person. But I really had to think long and hard about it because I thought, God, that's a little specialized. Is that really a, even a thing? <laughs> even though I had a, you know, I have a city planning degree. I mean, you know, some people might say that that's, you know, either – weird enough or not not you know uh focused enough i don't know but anyway so enough said just you know we we are working with a lot of the community members we hope that people will ask the core for an extension they can look on uh we'll be up till monday but on our website there's information i know there's there's information on the army corps of engineers 
website that you can find about the plan. And I just, I really hope, and there's one more information session if people are interested in learning more that's going to occur on um, Tuesday, October 26th from, I think that's 26, today the, yeah, or, or maybe the 26th, whatever day the 26th is, that might be actually, that is Monday, I think. Um, it's from 1 to 3. Yeah, it's Monday. And it, yeah. it, 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 Monday, sorry, Monday, October 26th from 1 to 3. And you have to go onto their site to, to log in. But it gives people an overview. They People ask a lot of good questions. Um, and I just I just hope more people will get involved. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and yeah, um, in case people want to look it up or if you didn't know, you were talking about people getting outdoors and the importance of it. And there's actually a thing some people call nature deficit disorder. Yeah, it's actually I do know study. that. <laughs> yeah. um, it's actual, you know, actually affects you. Real yeah. affliction, exactly. Epigenetics exactly. and everything. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's good you do what you do, helping people figure out thank how, you, to, too. how to enjoy the out of doors, how to use the out of doors, how to benefit from the out of doors. Yeah. We need more of that. Um, we do. Let people do. see that it's their friend, it's their home, it's not a scary place. Mm -hmm. um, exactly. And it makes us better. Um, yep. Support local businesses. Gyms are great. Um, they're really good for focusing on strength, um, some weights, but it should only be like a, a supplement or addition to functional movement outside in the real world where it matters. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like if there's flooding and you got to rescue someone. Um, it's not all like controlled as it is in some like machine in the gym, some like nice little bar you can grab yeah. or some little <laughs> weight on your shoulders that follows a given track. You know, you're in a boat, you're moving, you need balance. Um, you got to do all kinds of weird things. Um, maybe walk in water. Um, so the functional training would help us a lot more. In everyday life. Exactly. But picking up your kid, picking up groceries, picking up stuff off the floor, all kinds of things. But anyway, that's a different Exactly. Story. So, yep. um, that is. Do you have anything else you want to say about? Um, no. No. Cool. I think that's about it. Good. Good. I mean, I've really yeah. enjoyed talking. I really enjoyed talking about it. And yeah. thank yeah. you very yeah. much for giving me and the Katy Perry Conservancy, along with many of our other partners in this effort a chance to let you know a little bit about why we're trying to come up with alternative solutions to flood risk reduction yeah education, and what the core has education's important mm -hmm. a lot of stuff we don't know about yeah. how the world works yeah. the geology the ecology um why can't we just put concrete down and get the water out of here fast like that's actually got bad consequences <laughs> what else do we got to consider yeah. um yeah. So, yeah because you know you know if the water flows really fast out of your neighborhood it's probably damaging somebody else's neighborhood sure. right. so speed isn't always the only thing you want you have to really and, and i i do understand that the core has a very complex complicated job to do there's no question about that but i think they also need to do a better job of, of listening to the community and finding ways to figure out how to meet those community needs, how to incorporate nature, and how to come up with a solution that ultimately is going to work for us for many, many years. Because what we don't want is to have another disaster. We also want to do something quickly. You know, it's already been three years since Harvey. Mm -hmm. Almost, you know, now it's August and we're already in October. So three years and a, and a quarter. We do not want another disaster. So what can we do that's incremental? What can we do that's effective? What mm -hmm. can we do that just lets us get started today? And think about the consequences. Like some things I've learned through the years, study, reading, all that. Um, we need to think about what are the implications and think about the broader context. Because if we ignore that, there will be trouble, will be problems. Just mm -hmm. like... Mm -hmm. um, Teddy Roosevelt and others, um, even what maybe who was it? Some great naturalist, someone like John Muir, I forget who it was. Mm -hmm. No, Otto Leopold, I think. Yeah, Otto Leopold and Roosevelt 
they didn't know better and they had to learn thankfully they were smart enough to learn but at the time it was like um hey we want more deer and uh, more <laughs> exactly. elk to hunt so kill the predators i mean these mountain lions these wolves and coyotes they're killing all the deer and stuff just think how much what kind of a paradise in eden it would be if they weren't there just think we could hunt and then some of them did that and there's like um in the around the grand canyon ooh, what is it called i forgot the area i can put some stuff about it in the show notes later but um mm-hmm. kaibab k-i-a-b-a-b or b-o-b and the kaibab an area around the grand canyon um because it's not known exactly what happened there's different factors involving mm-hmm moving maybe cows and horses out and as well as getting rid of predators and stuff. But, um, there's other areas that were like this, like, um, Lamar Valley and Yellowstone. So the, um, predators are gone. Then it goes from like 5,000 to 25,000 or 70,000. The numbers aren't sure but that, that many deer, they eat everything. Then you got this massive yep. deer die off. Um, because of this right. ignorance no food. about what happened. Yeah. Think of consequences. Yeah. No, the same thing can happen with flooding. Or exactly. people around Florida might cut down some mangroves. Oh, hey, there's this great place. We can make a beach. Let's cut down these mangroves and get rid of them. But then there's these people on the other side of the world that's kind of like violating their rights because the fish they eat and that they must have for their survival grows in the mangrove take away the mangrove these people cannot eat i don't think you really have the yep. right to affect people like that um you should be able to do with your land whatever you want but we got to think about some consequences like that like you can't have a big fire on your land and smoke out the neighbor that's not right 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 but, right do no um, harm the, the mangrove how um predators were misunderstood thankfully leopold figured out crap it's like they are actually important i need to like support them and i think roosevelt too they Mm -hmm. corrected their opinion on that but there's consequence to things that we got to consider or i mean what happened with um and the fertile crescent (laughs) is it a fertile crescent anymore no it's a desert right right you know but um there's other situations like that where um there's really, really bad effects when you don't understand the full context. Um, don't take these causes into account. Um, right. So we need to do more of that with uh, managing the flooding. But anything else you want to add? Nope, that's it. Sounds cool. like we're kind of at the end of our session, but I really appreciate you inviting me to be part of your podcast yeah, and you. to talk about all these wonderful things. Got a little ph- philosophical here, which is fun. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, no, that's okay. That's fun and a little practical. But thank you, Michael. I really uh, am glad to now um, be a part of your program. Cool. Yeah, and thank you for what you do. Thank you. All right. Bye. All right. You have a good day. Thanks. Bye. You too. Bye bye.